is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, standing in for Francine. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Hawks ascendant. The ECB follows the Fed with a 50 basis point hike, but over a third of the governing council were said to have pushed for 75. Stocks keep moving lower. The EU backs a ninth package of sanctions against Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. The U.S. hits the nation's richest man with penalties, but spares his company, Norilsk Nickel. Plus, PMI surprise. Business activity in France contracted at a faster rate, while the downturn in Germany shows signs of easing, easing as inflation cools. Well, that was the numbers for Germany and France. Euro area data coming in. December services PMI at 49.1. That is a solid beat on the services front. It was expected to come in at 48 and a half. For manufacturing, that is also a beat, but not as strong. Coming in at 47.8. The forecast had been for 47.1. Let's see if that's having any impact on this bond market because we started the morning with weakening across European sovereigns and that is continuing. Your German 10-year yields, that is higher by nine basis points. BTPs higher by 16 basis points. Yesterday, these moves were massive off the back of a very hawkish Christine Lagarde. Germany saw its biggest move since 2008. Italian bonds, their biggest move since March 2020. So that continues with ECB governing council member Mueller saying that they need to hike more than the market currently expects. The market needs to readjust. That is certainly what we're seeing today. Of course, always concerning when Italian yields blow out more than the rest of Europe. Is the TPI protection going to have to come in soon with the ECB starting their QT? Meanwhile, the bad news continues. European stocks, those are down nine-tenths of one percent. Yesterday was the fifth worst day of this year for European stocks off the back of that ECB meeting. But Will this finally mean that a euro can resurge? We are looking at a stronger euro versus the dollar at 106. So here's the, the overall European map. It's really hard to find any countries that are spared from the ugliness of today's trading session. The DAX, that's down about 7 tenths. Cacaron down 9 tenths. UK FTSE 100, that's doing a little bit better. Uh, that's down just about half of 1%. But it is some ugly trading as we head into the end of the year. The Santa Claus rally not yet appearing for Europe. So let's really dig into that story because the ECB hiked interest rates by a half point with President Christine Lagarde warning that there were more moves ahead just like that to quell the worst inflation in the history of the euro. We judge that interest rates will still have to rise significantly at a steady pace to reach levels that are sufficiently restrictive to ensure a timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term target. Our future policy rate decisions will continue to be data dependent and follow a meeting by meeting approach. Joining us now is Andrew Pease, Russell Investment Global Head of Investment Strategy and Bloomberg's Joe Easton. Thank you both so much for joining this morning. Um, Joe, I want to start with you just to kind of set the scene of the ugliness for risk markets yesterday. I said the stat before European stocks, one of their worst days so far this year, and it seems that the ugliness is continuing. Yes, as you mentioned, I think it was the worst day since May yesterday and then down again today. Um, so clearly, Lagarde comments were the main driver being more you know, hawkish than expected. But also what was interesting for me was the infl inflation expectation. So they actually upped that um, for next year with a lot of people talking about inflation expect expectations easing. I thought it was interesting that the central bank there is actually pushing up their forecast for next year and giving some quite high um, predictions for the next couple of years as well. So clearly that's the main driver in terms of equities at the moment. And Andrew, when it comes to this bond market, it is another tough day uh, for European bonds. We're looking at, again, as I was pointing out, yields, especially in Italy, popping up yet again, more so than Germany. You write that fixed income, it's going to have a comeback after a rough 2022, but can it come back for this European market with an ECB who is unapologetically hawkish? Well, these, it, it was surprising how hawkish Lagarde was yesterday, but I think when you step back and look where the European economy is going, clearly the energy price shock has been significant. Most of the indicators are suggesting that Europe is not already in recession, it's heading in that direction. So I do feel that to some extent, Christina Lagarde is 
talking a quite a big game because she's trying to manage inflation expectations. But the reality of where the European economy is going may mean that potentially the uh, deposit rate may not get much above 3%, which is still quite tight policy by European standards. So I think we're not quite yet at the end of that interest rate adjustment, but I think as we get into early 2023, that will come into view. How are you viewing then the euro? Because it's stronger today, it was weaker yesterday, but you could have said that, look, this, this interest rate differential play, Andrew, was one that would benefit the euro, that the ECB, they're unrelenting, maybe the Fed will relent. Is that story going to come to fruition? Is it going to be a weaker dollar, stronger euro in 23? I think it can be. The interest rate differential story is only part of it. Clearly, the euro is one of the most undervalued currencies around, probably second only to the yen relative to its long-run purchasing power parity valuation. But the story of the of the euro and every other currency is going to be what happens to the dollar over 2023. It's been in this massive bull run since the financial crisis. Um, if we get a relatively mild recession in the US or even just a soft landing, um, I think that may be the most dollar bearish outcome, which would be bullish for the other currencies. But beyond that, a, a recession in the US, a bad recession, I think would be dollar, mm. uh, would be dollar strong, uh, euro bearish. I mean, the shape of this recession, it's something that we debated all 2022. We're still debating it here in December. Joe, to what degree is a recession priced into this European equity market? Well, I think European equities are cheap, but I don't think they're hugely cheap. I think the stock 600 trades about 15 times earnings, and I think that you know, it might get cheaper when earnings estimates come down. Um, as we go into probably the following two earnings seasons, earnings estimates will have to come down again. But I think in terms of the recession, I mean, one thing I would highlight is I think that central bankers are very divided across the regions. And the thing that stood out for me yesterday was the two Bank of England members who voted for no hike at all. They voted mm. to keep the rates as they were. Um, and they've not quite gone full uh, Danny Blanchflower, I think, wanted uh, the BOE to cut rates. They've not gone that far, but it's just a sign of how much uncertainty there is among central bankers at the moment. Right, there's that uncertainty among central bankers. But, Andrew, from, from where I'm standing, I see strategists after strategists say a recession is coming. Things are coming worse for stocks. Even Marco Kalanovic over at JP Morgan, who had been extremely bullish, is finally saying that stocks will fall in the first quarter. Is that not a really bullish sign that everybody at this point sees stocks falling, sees a recession coming? Well, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because this, this if it happens, it will be the most forecast recession ever. And everyone knows that economists in particular have a terrible track record of forecasting recession. So we have this tension where the economists are expecting recession, but the earnings numbers aren't at recession-like expectations yet. And that's why people are saying that there's more downside. The one thing I'd say, our process, we look at a lot of sentiment indicators because sentiment tells you where the psychology of the market is. We've had two major panic points in 2022. Psychology is still quite nervous, and that actually gives the market a bit of a bottom. So there is still the chance that markets once again confound expectations by not falling as much as the pessimists would argue they should. Um, Andrew, you also seem uh, more optimistic when it comes to 6040, who, let's be honest, the strategy had a very tough year. Walk me through your thinking there. Why does it come back? Yeah, I think the bigger picture is we always have to think about these things in the longer term. One thing we know is that markets and economies move in cycles. 2022 was probably the worst year for your classic 60-40 uh, portfolio since the early 1970s. I can't remember a year in which we've seen big losses in both double-digit losses in both equities and fixed income at the same time. The odds of that happening again are fairly low, but more particularly, 2022 was the year of the interest rate reset. We've now gone to a point now where interest rates, particularly long-term government bond yields, are back within their normal valuation ranges for most regions. And that's important for thinking about, firstly, fix can be a diversif diversifier for equities now. That's good for 6040. And also, fix can now start delivering the normal types of returns that you expect from that portfolio. So finally, the normality might be returning to this market. But, Joe, uh, uh, does the normality extend to this idea that bad news is bad news? We had some ugly U.S. eco data yesterday. Retail sales come in weaker. Um, bonds got a bid. Yeah, I mean, I think the data obviously this week has been, you know, pretty, pretty negative overall. If you look at we had the obviously the U.S. inflation data sort of kicked us off. 
Um, and if you look at the dollar, I think the dollar is pretty much unchanged on the week. Um, and I think that, you know, as you mentioned, the data is not looking great. The retail sales today was expected to rise and we saw a decline of around 0.3% on the month, I think. And that's even after government support for households on things like energy um, and with Christmas coming up. So the macro picture is obviously really um, poor at the moment. And as I mentioned, I do think that earnings estimates coming into the next two quarters will have to come down significantly and therefore you could see more downside in equities. Okay, Joe, thank you very much. Joe Easton there from our Bloomberg equity team. Andrew Pease, Russell, Russell Investments, Global Head of Investment Strategy. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us this morning. I want to bring you a breaking line on Mazars, the accounting firm. It had been hired by Binance, but Binance, Binance now says that Mazars is pausing all work for crypto clients. Again, they hired them in order to help verify their reserves, their token reserves. This is a concern for many investors, for many exchanges after the FTX drama. But again, Binance saying that Mazars is halting their work with their crypto clients. Now, coming up on the show, Beijing's sudden pivot away from COVID zero is confounding observers who says the move carries enormous risks for China. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Beijing's rapidly spreading COVID outbreak has turned the Chinese capital of 22 million people into virtual ghost towns as stores close and restaurants empty. It underscores the cost of President Xi Jinping's sudden pivot away from COVID zero. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Alan Wan. Alan, what is the mood currently in Beijing? Do things appear to be getting worse uh, with, co with this COVID outbreak or perhaps better as restrictions loosen? Well, first, uh, my, my buddy in Beijing called it a ghost town just because he saw more people out and about before the reopening than he's seeing them right now. Uh, but the mood in general has improved, um, by and large, uh, after we saw, like, stock images of long lines at hospitals, uh, shortages of medicine in the pharmacies, and even garbage piling up in the cities of Be in, in, in Beijing. Uh, the reason why is I, I think that... Um, you know, one thing is authorities are actually expanding the number of fever clinics. Uh, we're getting more antivirals uh, and a larger antiviral supply. Uh, government government is, uh, is, is keep, keeps on uh, making announcements like uh, we're going to get a fourth uh, COVID vaccination and a second booster for the elderly. And I think a, a lot of people are sort of uh, starting to accept the fact that they're likely to get it, get it, given the fact that a lot of their friends and relatives already have it already. But that said... I think uh, the mood could change depending on deaths. Right now, uh, we've only seen two reported deaths since the start, since the start of this month. And, uh, you know, we, I mean, it, it's, it seems like it's underreported, given the fact that, you know, in, Beijing, in Hong Kong earlier this year, when they reopened, we saw a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of deaths, especially elderly and unvaccinated people. Um, so that's sort of like the analogy a lot of people are making. But I think uh, we'll, we'll probably know more in the first quarter of next year uh, when we'll reach the peak of this current wave of, 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 uh, of, um, of people who are sick. What about the economic outlook? Of course, we have Chinese officials gathering uh, for a blueprint for the economic outlook for China, targeting 5% or higher growth. Um, how have forecasts coalesced around China, around its wider eco outlook? You know something, I'm surprised that, you know, analysts aren't getting a whiplash from all, all these changes they've had to make since the start of the year. I mean, right now you have UBS and ANZ, uh, they're uh, revising down their forecast for this year and revising them up for next year just because of the spread of, of COVID. I believe uh, UBS is cutting their forecast for this year to 2.7% and raising it for next year to 4.9%. Um, you know, to be honest with you, uh, you know, making these kind of projections aren't very difficult right now, given the, the slate of poor economic data we've been seeing over the last few, few months. Not just the, the headline, headline numbers, but even the high frequency data. Uh, stuff like mm. uh, tra uh, traffic congestion, 
a trial between cities, consumer, consumer sentiment, they're all down from a week ago. And we're seeing no pickup in other key areas, just like consumption, where spending on cinemas and um, hotels, uh, you know, just isn't happening right now. Right. Okay. Alan, thank you very much for the update. That's Bloomberg's Alan Wan in Shanghai. Coming up on the program, Sokjun CEO doesn't see a need to follow Wall Street's recent job cuts. That's even as the French bank intends to remain prudent on costs. We're going to have more from our exclusive interview with Frederic Udea next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Sockgen's outgoing CEO says he doesn't see a need to follow Wall Street's recent job cuts. That's even as the French bank intends to remain prudent in costs. I spoke to Frederic Udea in Paris at the sidelines of a conference. Take a listen. I think we are seeing at this stage some signs of a slowdown of the pace of inflation. I'm sure that the central banks will carry on monitoring all the parameters on the economies to, to caliber rightly their monetary policy. What is being done is needed. But again, I, I don't think that we are facing the same kind of scenario. There is a lot of uncertainty. External shocks can create the problem. Right. Uh, it's, let, let's face it. But in the absence of an external shock, we are uh, have in mind a, a, a slowdown, but which is that we can absorb. So what sort of shock are, are you concerned about? What would hit the level of, of changing things for you to erase that optimism? Uh, you know, a geopolitical uh, crisis, an evolution of the conflict in Ukraine. But just, if you wish, the way we will fare the winter and, and effectively uh, with uh, perhaps hopefully temperatures which are okay, which will mean uh, reserves, gas reserves being preserved as much as possible will help for the next 12 months in terms of gas prices. So there are many parameters which can play a role in the, in the inflation. Wage evolution also. Mm. At this stage, I see also companies which are trying to avoid entering into a cycle where wages are increasing too much. So they want to preserve the future. So again, uh, every, every month we will see how it goes. The wait-and-see approach from SockGen CEO there, Frederic Odea, who, of course, is leaving in May 2023. Let's now get to the Bloomberg First Word News. With that is Leanne Gerens. Good morning, Leanne. Good morning, Danny, and thank you. EU member states are said to have reached a deal on a ninth package of sanctions on Russia. The measures will target Moscow's access to drones, more Russian banks, as well as officials responsible for allegedly abducting children from Ukraine. The package will impact more than 100 individuals and dozens of entities. Now, Slovakia's government has been toppled after its ruling coalition lost a motion of no confidence yesterday initiated by the Freedom and Solidarity Party who withdraw from, from the government in September. The vote deepens a political chaos where months of infighting has hampered legislation and makes a snap election more likely in a country with pro-Russian opposition leaders. Pubs and restaurants in London that survived COVID are now facing a Another threat, persistent train strikes. Restaurant seatings on the first day of rail strikes this week collapsed to levels not seen since Omicron when face masks were compulsory on public transport and the government was telling people to work from home. Earlier this week, office occupancy in the capital fell to around 20% compared to more than 50% at times before the strikes. And US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer have told CNN that Joe Biden should run for re-election in 2024. The 80-year-old U.S. president is the oldest person to ever hold office and faces Democrats calling for a younger generation to lead the party. Biden has said he is likely to run again, but will make a final decision by early next year. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. 
This is Bloomberg. Danny. Leanne, thank you so much. Leanne Garens here in London. A quick check in on the European sovereign bond market because the sell off is deepening after yesterday's. You're looking at another 20 basis points or so of gains in Italian 10 year yields. That puts the total two day move at about 50 basis points. We're also looking at German 10 years. Those are moving higher by about 10 basis points. So we had a hawkish ECB yesterday. The hawkishness continues today. Mueller saying that they can't rely on economic slowdown curbing inflation alone and rates are likely to rise more than the market expects. Also falling this morning is Bitcoin down 2%. This falling after those headlines we discussed earlier of the accounting firm that Binance had hired they are no longer going to be working with crypto firms. There was concern over Binance and really the entirety of exchanges of proving they have the reserves to back things up. The counting firms were supposed to help them do that. So fear right now in these markets. This is Bloomberg. Talks ascendant, the ECB follows the Fed with a 50 basis point hike, but over a third of the governing council were said to have pushed for 75. Stocks move lower. The EU backs a ninth package of sanctions against Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. The U.S. hits the nation's richest man with penalties, but spares his company, Norlis Nickel. Plus, PMI surprise, the euro area manufacturing downturn is easing as supply chain snarls abate and inflation slows, signaling the bloc's economic slump will be less steep than feared. Well, you made it to Friday after a week that has been very eventful. It's been a very eventful 48 hours that has seen continued hawkishness from central banks, perhaps less so from the Fed. Not too many surprises, though, of course, the dot plot did show us the terminal rates might be above 5 percent. The real surprise did seem to center around Christine Lagarde and the ECB, a series of 50 basis point hikes. Madame Lagarde was clear to say there is no pivot coming, and we continue to see sovereign bonds sell off today. Now we're also getting some flash PMI numbers in this time from the UK. We're looking at manufacturing coming in weaker. 44.7. The forecast is 46 and a half services. Those are stronger. This is a similar story. I must say that we saw to Germany. UK services coming in at 50. The forecast was 48.5. So a bit of a patchy story there. I should say in France it was weaker all around, but we are seeing some strength for both Germany uh, and UK when it comes to services. Now let's pivot a little bit from Europe to China. Investors are awaiting any news from China's Central Economics Work Conference, which Bloomberg sources says, say were scheduled to begin on Thursday. Observers expect President Xi Jinping and his officials to flesh out policy objectives for the coming year. For more, we're joined by Ginny Yan, head of China strategy at ICBC Standard Bank. Ginny, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, look, it, it it's been a bumpy reopening, to say the least, considering there are now fears of more COVID cases, people staying in. How are you thinking about China and its economic trajectory as it backs away from COVID zero? Look, I think with all of the economies, particularly major economies opening up, we are expecting that bumpy roads where essentially logistics needs to recover. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, as yesterday's data print confirmed, the fundamentals are very much lagging the market sentiment. Um, and of course, this quicker than expected opening also means that, um, you know, corporates need to start to think about their inventories, have they oversupplied, mm -hmm. etc. So all of that means that up until probably March, which is when the two sessions happen, um, a lot of adjustments need to take place. So uh, a refinement in terms of expectations mm. by investors are necessary in the coming weeks. How should we adjust our expectations in once we finally get to see some of the benefits, what that will actually look like? Because to some degree, it's, it's our, our bias of, of living in the UK where we had massive stimulus or in Europe or in the US makes us think that, okay, perhaps China sees that. But of course, they didn't undergo the same stimulus drive that the US, US and Europe did. So what will reopening actually look like? Do we need to reset our expectations there? Well, with China, what's different is that stimulus has been in place 
for the entirety of the three years. Mm. Accommodative monetary policy, fiscal policy, all these additional fiscal uh, measures that were rolled out. And recent voices from Beijing is very much confirming a continued supportive policy measure coming out in the next few weeks. So whether it's the property sector, mm. whether it's continued boosting of consumption, this is what we're going to expect. So for sure, we will probably get some revenge spending, mm. for example, from households as long as this current wave of COVID is being digested. So I'm positive. I think that China has been relatively resilient despite the headwinds and will continue to be resilient. But what we need is clear evidence that that turning point has come and we await that data. Well, will we likely see with China again the same trajectory that the West embarked on of if it starts in the goods sector and then it moves to services? Yeah. That's right. Well, China, as we know, is already transforming into the services sector, high-end, innovation-driven economy. That's exactly the types of sectors that will receive the investment. And for sure, all of that will be nurtured. But of course, what we're struggling in the meantime is the catch-up of the logistics industry. And that's what we're hearing, ensuring that logistics are caught up, supply chain disruptions are minimized. Mm. So a focus on domestic domestic consumption is very important for 2023. Does that mean things like cracking down on big tech's hold, um, too much leverage in the property sector, these sorts of you know, social stability and fiscal prudent projects, do those then need to take a back seat for the expense of economic growth? Good point. However, I think the overall theme of common prosperity means that no one loses out. So there will not be a targeted crackdown on certain industries. Even the property sector, tech industry, they will all benefit. But what's going to be key is that everyone benefits. So reducing inequality, making sure that everyone, including and especially the working population benefit out of the current mm. and uh, incoming uh, bout of stimulus and, and uh, recovery. How, how important is foreign investment in all of this in the road to recovery for China? Well, I think foreign investment has always been important. Not only, of course, that direct investment, portfolio flows. We're seeing more and more investors very much attracted by China opening up to more foreign investors. So China's growth story should only encourage more investors. Mm. And that stability is very important. We see it from, for example, Chinese government bond yields. Despite the headwind, the bond yields have remained relatively uh, stable. And with that turnaround, I'm sure that yield inversion with USTs may also see some positive uh, uh, trajectory. So what I think is that both portfolio and FDI direct investment may start to well continue to be kept in China but also come back to China mm. as we see fundamentals improve for that how important is the geopolitical story we you know we made a lot of, of, of President Biden and President Xi talking um, there had been concerns before during Russia's invasion of Ukraine that perhaps China sides with Russia and isolates itself that geopolitical aspect to the story how necessary is it again to make sure that the foreign direct investment foreign investment in general comes in well, I think I, uh, Beijing is very aware that geopolitics comes into a lot of that, particularly with its largest trading partners. But we're seeing some improvements in terms of the sentiment, mainly that there needs to be a constructive way to move forward. We're seeing that with the US, we're seeing that with the UK, we're also seeing that with Europe. Mm. So lots of bilateral visits which are upcoming right. will help matters. And I think that's, you know, very much to be welcomed by markets. Okay, Jenny, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for joining us. Jenny Yan there, head of China strategy at ICBC Standard Bank. Enjoy your holiday season, Jenny. Coming up, don't miss our interview with Nico Stathopoulos, chair of Europe at BC Partners. We're gonna talk private equity. That's next, this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. 
Now let's talk about private equity and how it's faring amid soaring inflation and fears of a global downturn. BC Partners has $41 billion in assets with a focus on private equity, credit and real estate in Europe and North America. And I'm very pleased to say that joining us now is the chair of Europe at BC Partners. It's Nikos Stathopoulos. Nikos, thanks so much for joining this morning. So look, we, we are meeting the day after an ECB where it feels like at least on the public market side, everybody is gearing up for recession. Bond yields are moving higher, stocks are selling off. And what you see, the many companies in Europe that you interact with, are those fears of recession founded? Well, first of all, thank you for having me again. Um, I think there's no doubt inflation is there, interest rate heights are there. Um, and I think the fear of recession is also there. I would say the fundamentals of our companies remain very solid. Mm. Uh, what we've seen in the key indicators, the balance sheets of companies remain strong. The labor market is strong. Um, so overall, for now, we're not seeing that recession, but I think we're bracing ourselves, especially in the European side, and certainly in this country, where all the expectations is that uh, the impact of food, energy, interest rates, etc., will impact uh, the business. So we're bracing ourselves for that. What does it look to brace for a recession? How do you prepare for that and prepare your portfolio companies for that? You make sure that your cost structure is, is in a way that you actually can sustain a drop in, uh, on the top line, on the revenues. You try to see if there's anything you can do on pricing and, and try to, to help grow that top line because that's important. But mainly, it's all about protecting the margins, protecting the cash flows. So in the event that the recession hits, or if it's stronger than it's expected, then that you are uh, effectively protected on the downside. So do you have to have some pretty tough conversations with founders at this moment then? Things like, you know, perhaps you want to trim back on staffing, on bonuses. What, what are those conversations like right now? We're having tough conversations with our management teams mm. and with the, with the CEOs of our companies because, of course, when they prepare their budget for next year, they themselves, of course, are not sure how the world is going to look like. So, yes, we have to have some buffers when it comes to staff costs, as you correctly say, wage increases, which are inevitable in an environment of inflation. Right. Um, and anything else that we can have in order to make sure we maintain the cost structure as, as lean as we can. Do we need to think about Europe's business model differently? And I, I ask this because, yes, it's been a mild winter. The energy crisis hasn't been as bad as many people had feared. But so much of Europe industry was dependent on cheap energy sources from Russia. If that's gone, does the competitiveness of corporate Europe, does it take on a different form? It's undoubtedly the, the energy costs are higher and we're forecasting higher also in energy costs for next year. Um, I think the competitiveness unfortunately has been impacted mm. for Europe and we see it more exactly as you say in our European portfolio than in our US portfolio where Europe has been harder hit by the energy crisis. Um, whether how sustainable it's going to be and how long this is going to last, we, we don't know. But certainly for 2023 and, and maybe even for 2024, we're expecting higher energy costs. Um, some of our companies have hedged their energy mm. uh, costs and that has benefited them. But um, I think the expectation is that Europe will be hit harder. I know when we last talked in summer at the Super uh, Investor Conference in Berlin, uh, we talked about this idea that the valuations, any of that fall, hadn't exactly shown up yet because there was this hesitance to actually sell in what's a difficult market. Ha has that shown up yet? What do valuations look like for the industry? Are, are they, again, under as much stress as this public market is, for example? So valuations have come down. Uh, the interest rates increases, by definition, have resulted in valuations coming down. We've seen it more in the public markets so far than mm -hmm. in the private markets. You've seen the S&P 500 being down almost 15% since the beginning of the year. Even Euro stocks as well has been down. We've seen P multiples coming down between four and five turns in the public markets. They haven't yet translated exactly the same in the private markets mm. today, but we are definitely seeing valuations coming down. What does that mean for, for deal flow? Are, are folks still hesitant to, to actually sell again and, and, and crystallize that sort of loss? They are. Mm. Uh, so a lot of the, that's why you've seen also the deal activity, especially private equity activity in 2022 being down more than 30% because uh, the sellers are sort of holding back for now uh, because they don't want to sell in this environment. Uh, buyers are still willing and able to do so, but you need, you need uh, both uh, a seller's market as well. So the activity has been more subdued. Financing has not helped that either because right. financing markets have been effectively shut. 
So people, what do, you, what do you do then? I mean, if you want to do a deal and you need financing and you can't turn to a bank, what, what's been the alternative? Right the alternative now? has been private credit. Mm. Uh, so if you see universally in 2022, most of the deals that were done have been financed with private credit. Uh, in some cases, you've seen some seller financing, some vendor loans. Um, you've seen also minority deals happening so that there's no change of control and you don't need to refinance um, the debt. Uh, but private credit has been effectively the savior of the day. Um, mm. It's more expensive but it has longer maturities and uh, it has no amortization and effectively has been the only way today we could have financed uh, transactions. Because it, it is a tough environment you're describing, talking about companies, proofing them for a recession, financing is difficult. But when you think about 2023, are you optimistic, Nikos? I am, actually. I am optimistic because I think inflation seems to be peaking. I think the central bank monetary policies seem to be, and I suspect it will cool off. Um, I've also seen in similar periods of, of uh, distress, like post Lehman, for example, that that quasi-closure did not last very long mm. because um, the markets cannot afford to be closed for too long. The system cannot afford to be functioning, not to be functioning for too long. Banks need revenues. Um, investors need to deploy capital. And I've seen, as I said, the fundamentals, the key indicators of, of businesses and markets are there. Mm. You know, balance sheet is strong, labor market is strong, the capital markets are orderly, and there's a lot of liquidity in the system. So I would say pricing risk in this environment remains very difficult and it needs that conviction and discipline. But um, I think in, in, in these times of uncertainty, we've seen in the past that the best opportunities come through. And also the fact that we've seen that both public and private markets have been very resilient. Mm. So, yes, I'm optimistic. Well, well, given that and given that perhaps some some folks out there are overly doom and gloom, valuations are coming down. Where specifically are you seeing opportunities then that perhaps are underpriced in this current environment if it is going to get better next year? I think we'll see opportunities, I think, in the more resilient sectors that we've seen in the past, like in healthcare, for example, or in, in telecoms, uh, sectors where they've been sort of downside protected probably less so the sectors that are more directly exposed to consumer mm. um, because the consumer has been hardly hit and most likely will continue to being so in 2023. But again, sectors where we feel that that resilience is there and that downside protection is there because that's the only thing we can bet on today. Mm. Because one week away from the holidays, we need, we need that bit of optimism. Thank you for bringing it to us. Nico Stathopoulos, Chair of Europe at BC Partners. Now let's get to your Bloomberg Business Flash. With that is Leanne Garens. Good morning, Leanne. Good morning, Danny, and thank you. Twitter has suspended accounts of upstart rival service Mastodon and several prominent journalists covering its billionaire owner, Elon Musk. Late last night, reporters from the Washington Post, New York Times, and others were listed as blocked, with Musk calling the posting of his real-time location basically assassination coordinates. The standard Twitter ban for disclosing personal locations information, also known as doxing, is actually seven days. Now, China is said to be consolidating purchases from about 20 of its largest steelmakers in a new single state-owned company. The move marks the biggest change to the global iron ore market since 2010. The company, called China Mineral Resources Group, will use its buying power to secure discounts as soon as next year. The Philippine Central Bank has raised its benchmark interest rate to a 40 year high, joining others around the world attempting to crack down on inflation. In an exclusive interview with Bloomberg TV, Governor Philip Medella told us that more tightening is yet to come. Our own forecast is that inflation will be back to 2 to 4 percent by the third or fourth quarter of next year. So, so in other words, uh, what, what we have to do is do more to make sure that that happens. And about 200 Chinese companies no longer face an imminent threat of being booted off American stock exchanges. The U.S. Public Company Accounting Oversight Board says its inspectors have been able to sufficiently review audit documents from firms listed in the U.S. The announcement came after recent inspections by the board in Hong Kong, which was a major breakthrough in the long-running dispute. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Danny. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up on the program, we are just two days away from the World Cup final, and the excitement among the fans is reaching a fever pitch. We're live in Qatar next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Crypto is falling this morning. Bitcoin is down 2%. Mazars, uh, an accounting firm that's done a lot of work with these firms to do these so-called proof of reserves reports, is pausing all work for crypto clients. This, according to Binance, the, sp the spokesperson from the company also saying that they're pausing work with Crypto.com, KuCoin, and again, Binance, as I mentioned. Um, they have been at the forefront of this idea of publishing these proof of reserves reports. They have seen scrutiny in themselves because it might not be as robust, as thorough as some would like to make sure these crypto exchanges have the reserves to back up client money. Now, from Bitcoin to football, we are just two days away from the World Cup final in Qatar, where Argentina and France will face off for football's ultimate prize. My co-anchor of Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, Manus Cranny, is at the Lucille Stadium in Qatar, where the final will take place on Sunday. Manus, I've been watching you. You've been practicing your game. You've been practicing Daddy. the headers. You are, you are ready in case Messi moves. goes down and the coach needs someone. <laughs> Manus, oh my God, you are on fire, Manus. We're going to get rid of that Tell, for the moment. Right. I was hoping you'd do another header, but we'll, we'll save the camera person over there so you don't knock them out. All right. All right, Manis, give us your breakdown. I mean, look, you are there in the tiny Gulf country of Qatar. How has this tournament changed things? I think the world has suddenly realized where Qatar is. They certainly know where Saudi Arabia is after the oil debacle between the White House and the House of Saud. But record viewership, record spending for FIFA. FIFA's going to earn $7.5 billion, we, we reckon. Uh, many people traveled to Dubai and hubbed over in shuttle flights here to Qatar. But there's certainly, I mean, if you want to understand what 45 billion bucks gets you, it's this. It's we're at Lucelle Stadium. This is where the final will be. They've spent $300 billion. If you're going to do a big trade, look big, look large, and make an impact. Eight stadiums, eight stadiums, some of them reusable, but they are gargantuan in their presence. In terms of did they get the numbers over the door, 765 million arrived in the first couple of weeks. That's a lot less, 40% less than we'd expected. But I think the world certainly knows where Qatar is for lots and lots of reasons, for good and for bad. Danny. Manis, we only got a minute here, but I know you've been tracking where terminal clients think who's going to win. Come on, break it down for us. Who's got the advantage on Sunday? You got W Cup Go. You can hop on there. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Lionel Messi is a phenomenal. There was that imagery of his head in his hands when Saudi Arabia trounced Argentina, and then he went on to score five goals in this tournament. W World, uh, World Cup Go gives you the odds. Argentina incrementally ahead of uh, France because Brazil got knocked out. So the odds have shifted, Danny. But I think when it comes to spend, and in soccer, by the way, soccer, not football, the most watched <laughs> match ever in the United States of America was England U. SA. So if you want impact, uh, there you go. I was going to say, I was I was in those numbers. I was watching it very closely. Manis, I mean, speaking close to my heart, calling You're it soccer that. instead of football. I definitely appreciate it. All right, Manis Cranny there wow, outside the Lucille Stadium. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. We believe that the market has run ahead of itself. It's a real winter of discontent at the moment. Central banks have kept interest rates too low for too long. We're now transitioning to this environment where central banks are divided. In some respects, um, you know, I think the Fed's been dealt a better hand than the ECB. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Rough week for equities. U.S. futures drop along with European stocks as investors around the globe price in more rate hikes and grow increasingly worried about recession. The latest COVID outbreak turns Beijing into a ghost town. It could be a preview of what's next for the rest of China as it moves on from COVID zero. And the European Union targets Russia once again. It signed off on a ninth package of sanctions targeting banks 
and drones. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kayleigh Lyons in New York. Matt Miller is off today. Well, the sober reality of the hawkish rhetoric really hitting risk assets this week, Kayleigh. We continue to see that here in Europe and into U.S. futures. Yeah, it hasn't been a pretty week, and it doesn't look like the week is going to end on a pretty note either. It definitely didn't in Asia overnight, Anna. You actually had the MSCI Asia Pacific Index snapping six weeks of gains with a loss of about three quarters of one percent today, which makes it a weekly loss as well. What was actually leading the decline was Japanese equities overnight. The Nikkei was down about 1.9%. Maybe part of that having to do with the Japanese yen gaining some strength back could be a little bit of a bid for a safe haven there. Also bets on perhaps a policy pivot coming from the BOJ next year. But dollar yen uh, down, dollar down against the yen by about four tenths of 1% trading at 137.20. That is actually your biggest outperformer in both Asian and G10 foreign exchange. Meanwhile, the Chinese yuan also slightly Slightly, slightly stronger against the U.S. dollar, but of course in China they are dealing with a rapid outbreak of COVID-19 in big cities like Beijing due to the really rapid easing of restrictions that's resulting in a lot of infections right now. Dollar offshore yuan trading at 698. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., we do look set for a third consecutive day of losses when it comes to U.S. stocks. S&P 500 futures right now down about 1% after a 3% loss over the last two days after the Fed policy decision, of course, really weighing now concerns about a recession that may be forthcoming. In the bond market, we're up four basis points on the 10-year yield right around the 348 level. And keep an eye on oil as well. We had three strong days to start the week, so we could still see a very slight weekly gain. But WTI futures are down about 2.5% this morning, trading at $74 a barrel. Again, demand concerns, really what we're watching there. And then I wanted to point to Bitcoin as well. You have a lot of contagion concern when it comes to exchanges that may or may not still be healthy, of course, in the wake of FTX. Now the concern surrounds Binance, which has been pressured to publish proof of reserves that it can back customer assets one for one. It said that its auditing firm that was working with finance now is no longer working with crypto clients. So that seems to be weighing on sentiment broadly in the crypto universe. And a Bitcoin right now down 2%, trading right above $17,000. Yeah, that audit firm no longer working with any crypto clients, as you point out, Kaylee, which is uh, an interesting development. This is what we see on Europe right now. Uh, a, a worsening picture, really. We have European stocks under pressure, down half a percent in the foot on the FTSE 100. The CAC down nine tenths of a percent. The DAX down seven tenths of a percent. In fact, only one sector has really been in positive territory for any uh, long period this morning, and that is around the banking sector. So that higher rates environment that uh, spooks other assets, perhaps actually benefiting the banking sector. On that note, we've just had some euro area final. Uh, uh, reading on CPI, the November core CPI rising 5% year on year. The estimate was for exactly that, an increase of 5%. So that's broadly in line. If you look at the, uh, if you look at one of the other uh, data points, though, we've got a number that starts with a 10 and actually 10.1% versus an estimate of just 10. So maybe not moving in the right direction on that European inflation story. Certainly the Italian final number coming in a little bit higher than had been anticipated. Only a tenth of a percent, but it's those kind of uh, moves either side of expectation that can. And, uh, spook markets a little bit but do we see much movement on the euro and well, a bit of a bit of uh, a movement in the euro as a result but 106 is pretty much where we were trading prior to that data hitting uh, some interesting PMI numbers coming out from Europe a little bit earlier on Kaylee and they painted a picture of maybe the pace of deterioration in Europe moderating and so that's a sort of better story if you like the pound at 121.44 yesterday of course we saw the strength of the dollar certainly to the fore the pound lost ground as a result today we've got PMI data out for the UK which shows that the manufacturing sector is really weak. A 44 handle on that PMI for that sector. The services sector doing a lot better up at 50, but perhaps that creates headaches for the Bank of England. The Italian 10-year yield, I put this in here because we continue to see another day where European yields are on the rise. It's not just Italy, it's France, it's Germany, it's the UK as well. That hawkish rhetoric we heard from the uh, ECB yesterday having a widespread impact, it would seem. And I put this one in here as a stock story to keep an eye on. It, it is a global story as well as being uh, the largest gainer on the stock 600 this morning, up 60 percent then for games workshop group it makes those tabletop games those sort of war uh, role play games Kaylee that either you you are familiar with or you are not and uh, basically <laughs> they've done a deal with Amazon and that deal means that Amazon is going to make TV programs and films around their intellectual property and that it seems is good for that stock 
Yeah, so good for at least one stock today, Anna, but broadly, of course, stocks are lower. It seems that risk sentiment just not really able to hang in there after a massive week for central bank rate hikes, as well as weak U.S. economic data. That is what sent stocks plunging yesterday, and that is continuing this morning. Nadia Level, senior U.S. equity strategist at UBS Global Wealth Management, spoke with Bloomberg yesterday on what she sees this market pricing in. We don't think a recession is pricing. I mean, much of what you've seen this past year has been the market response to higher rates. The pullback that you're seeing in the market today, we aren't surprised by it. Remember, this is a market that has been traded on hope, hope of the Fed not doing what they say they would do. But yesterday's dot sent a clearly different message with 17 of those dots above 5%. And so the risk is skewed to the upside. Valerie Titel, Bloomberg Markets reporter, is joining us now for more on the week that was. Valerie, we knew it was going to be a big and possible, possibly volatile one, and it turned out that way. Yeah, let's hope it's the last exciting week of the year. I think I've had enough in 2022. Uh, but I want to talk about the data yesterday and the reaction of the, of the uh, equity market. We had that weak retail sales print, and equity markets fell. And why do I want to talk about this? Well, for most of the year, strong economic data has been uh, denting stocks. That's because the stronger the U.S. Uh, economy is, the higher the Fed has to go, the higher yields go, and the weakness in stocks because of that. And we're now seeing a, a decent flip. Yesterday, the retail sales number dented stocks. We also had um, uh, weak manufacturing data coming out of the U.S. And if we look at it back on the week, we can think maybe this correlation is back. Stocks trade lower and bonds are bid. Treasuries rally. Yields are lower on the back of that. And we can say, whoopee, this correlation might finally be back. It's been a rare year in markets that we've had both of these assets falling together. Um, uh, but, but look, as we, as, as we look ahead to, to, to next year, the, the, this, this correlation is going to be flipping, and it might be flipping meaningfully. Uh, let it, we're not going to be staring at um, higher and hotter inflation data that, that spurs yields higher. Instead, we might be focused on weak data, the U.S. slowdown, weak uh, equities, and, and bonds are bid on the back of that. And, and maybe we might be jumping for joy that this correlation might finally be, be done. OK, something to watch. Valerie, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel getting uh, perhaps excited that we get towards the end of the year. Now, let's uh, talk about what's going on in China and the pivot away from COVID-0. Beijing's rapidly spreading COVID outbreak has turned the Chinese capital of 22 million people into a virtual ghost town as stores close and restaurants empty. It underscores the cost of President Xi Jinping's sudden pivot away from that COVID-0 policy. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Alan Wan. And Alan, what is, what is the mood like then in Beijing? I mean, this just underlines the, uh, the, the difficulty that, that the country is going to have in moving away from COVID-0. Yeah. Well, you know, I have a buddy in Beijing. He's been calling the city a ghost town because he's, he's, uh, he's seeing actually fewer people out and about now than before the reopening. But by and large, the mood has calmed a bit since last week when we saw stock images of uh, long lines at hospitals, empty, empty shelves and pharmacies, and even garbage piling up. I mean, what, what's helping, you know, though, is that there's been a rapid expansion of fever clinics, uh, increased supply of antivirals, even uh, soothing statements from the government, including uh, one where they're prepping a fourth uh, COVID vaccination and a second booster for el elderly people. Um, but a, a lot of this could change uh, depending on um, deaths. Okay, right now we only have two official deaths since the start of the month. It sounds a bit un underreported, uh, given the fact that in Hong Kong um, we saw like a a wave of deaths, especially of elderly unvaccinated people right after reopening. So we're going to have to like wait and see, but we'll probably know more after this current wave uh, ends in the first quarter of uh, next year. Well, Alan, as you talk about massive cities that look like ghost towns, that is not a great signal for economic activity. I know we have had a few firms adjusting their China growth forecast. What is the wider economic outlook here? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm surprised the analysts aren't getting a whiplash from all this. Uh, they keep changing the forecast since the reopening. This time you have like banks like uh, UBS and ANZ. They're actually cutting their forecast for this year and, and uh, raising them for next year because of the spread of COVID. I mean, um, I think, well, UBS anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's cutting 2.7% this year and raising the 4.9% uh, next year. But it shouldn't be very surprising that they're doing this just because we've had so much like lousy economic data over the last few weeks, um, not just in terms of the headline data like industrial output and GDP, but even like the high frequency data 
such as uh, traffic congestion, travel between cities, consumer confidence, they've all dropped this week. And uh, it doesn't look like uh, things are going to improve, especially in, in key areas like consumption, where uh, we see no pickup in terms of spending in cinemas and um, hotels uh, right now, which, which, which shows that you know, a lot of people are avoiding uh, you know, crowded places. Mm. Yeah, Alan, really interesting reporting. Uh, Bloomberg's Alan Wan there just underlining that the fact that it won't really be a straight line to a kind of living with COVID reality in China. Let's get back to Europe. European leaders meeting in Brussels and they are said to have agreed to a new package of sanctions on Russia. They also urged European energy ministers to complete a deal on a price cap uh, on natural gas. As soon as Monday, for more, let's go to our correspondent Maria Tadeo, who's in Brussels for us. Uh, what was agreed then last night, Maria? A ninth package of sanctions, is that right? Yes, and Anna, this was a final meeting for the year. A lot of the agenda, I was no, or I would know, because I was working until midnight on this thing. And a lot of things, in fact, were approved and got green-lighted uh, yesterday. Yes, you do have the sanctions. They target more Russian banks. They target more Russian individuals. But crucially, this is about the drone sectors, the export ban on technology that can help Russia with drones. Remember, right now, the fight, this is a drone warfare, what's going on in Ukraine. On top of that, you had the green light to the 18 billion euro financing for Ukraine in 2023. Although we know the criticism from Ukrainians is that the European Union promises a lot on paper, but is very slow on the cash out. And then finally, and you alluded to this, a political message, but this was uh, a, a, really a, a massive political message from European leaders that come Monday there needs to be an energy deal agreed by ministers that this cannot wait yeah. until 2023 they cannot drag it you have to get it done on Monday well on that subject of the energy deal Maria we heard from the chairman of Angie yesterday who is feeling less optimistic on the prospects of such a deal just take a listen to what he said am I optimistic that a solution will uh, appear today I used to be an optimistic person. In this case, I think the debate will be very complex. Are and I'm not sure that we will end up with something which, at the end of the day, will have an impact. Are, are you worried about European unity in general as these debates go on? I think on the, what we've seen on the energy field is not reassuring. We've seen uh, the beginning of a fragmentation of the uh, European landscape. And on the subject of fragmentation, Maria, he says he's worried that that is going to stall an agreement on the price cap. Does Monday look realistic at all? Look, if you had asked me that, if you had asked me just to go back to that point, that question two days ago, I probably would have agreed with him and would have said no. But yesterday, the signaling, the reporting, the information that we have from that room, the 27 leaders really throwing their political weight to get something done on Monday. They do not want to drag this conversation into 2023. The point now, and this is crucial and, and it has not been solved, is what is the price cap? Where do you set it? The commission came out with 270 euros megawatt. Some countries suggested it is too high. We now understand the range is going from 160 euros to 220 euros megawatt hour. That is a big question to me. It's not so much the deal, but the price point that will settle this thing. And that, for the time being, there's no consensus on that. All right, well, we will look for your continued reporting on this. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Now to another story we're watching this morning, Binance. The crypto exchange says French auditing firm Mazars, Mazars has paused work for all crypto clients globally. Binance was one of those clients as it has been pushed to prove it can fully back customer assets. The firm is facing a crisis of confidence following the swift collapse of FTX and a surge in withdrawals that followed that. As for how this is translating into crypto stocks in Free market trading, obviously Binance, not a publicly listed company, but one of the biggest exchanges that is publicly listed here in the U.S. is Coinbase. And that stock is lower to the tune of about 2% in pre-market trading. And other crypto stocks like Marathon Digital are down by about that much as well. It is a much larger move, though, for a company in the health space, Garden. It released the results of one of its tests for colorectal cancer, the accuracy rate, disappointing investors. So that stock is down about 33%. But a company that makes a rival test that is more more accurate is gaining off the back of that same news. Exact scientist 
uh, sciences up about 18%. And one final stock to watch that is moving higher today is Adobe. It reported results last night that topped expectations. It also reaffirmed its outlook for next year. Analysts pretty positive on what that signal is about demand for creative software. As a result, Adobe up about 4% before the bell, Anna. Coming up on the program, we will speak to Des Lawrence, State Street Global Advisor, Senior Investment Strategist. We will put into context all that we have learned about central banks this week, what that means for investment strategy into 2023. We'll also think about commodities next year. Goldman's Jeff Curry says commodities will be the best performing asset class next year. More from our interview with him. That's coming up shortly. What happens when China, the largest commodity consumer in the world, the largest oil importer in the world, begins to rebound significantly in the first part of next year? It's going to tighten all of these markets tremendously and put a lot of upward pressure on prices. And what you see in these periods of higher inflation when central banks ease more slowly into the recession is they last longer and the drawdowns in assets are longer. So we'd expect kind of double the normal length of a recession because the Fed's not going to be at your back for a long time. And that's a big deal. That was Greg Jensen, co-CIO of Bridgewater Associates, speaking with Bloomberg yesterday about recession risk. Joining us now to discuss further is Denitza Tetskova, Bloomberg cross-asset reporter. So Denitza, when we look cross-asset across bond and stock markets, what kind of recession risk realistically is priced in? Yeah, so for the last two weeks, we've definitely seen uh, a big shift in rhetoric. And, you know, all year round, we've talked about the good news being bad news. And now we talk a lot more about, well, bad news for the economy is actually uh, bad news for the stock market. Uh, and in bonds, we're actually seeing a different reaction. We saw it this uh, week with CPI. We saw it after the retail sales, manufacturing data. Uh, and we're seeing more and more people talk about bonds going back to that traditional role of old uh, um, safe haven assets. Um, and of course, they still provide good yield. So there has been a lot more interest uh, from investors. If you look at the Bank of America survey, actually, investors are most overweight bonds versus stocks uh, since 2009. And also they believe the best performing asset next year will be government bonds. So that's mm. quite a significant shift. Yeah, quite a shift. And we talked to quite a few guests, actually, Denise, who talked to us about this uh, the pivot into bonds as we head into recession fears taking uh, centre stage. I wonder how that sits along with the rising yield environment we're seeing post-ECB. But we'll come to that uh, later on with another guest. What about equity funds and what we're seeing from equity fund flows? So with your cross-asset uh, cross asset hat on, what do you see there? Yeah, so this year is to be a very interesting cycle of every few months. We see a slight increase in equity allocation to only fall back down a few weeks later. And it's been kind of a cycle of a bear market rally starting from oversold conditions. So maybe we see some good data, some Fed speak, uh, then hedge funds reduce their equity, uh, reduce their shorts, investors buy some equities. And a few weeks later, we see the opposite things. Uh, hedge funds come back in, increase their shorts, and investors just sell the stocks they've just bought. Uh, and we saw that this week. We saw the S&P broke below its 200-day average last week, this week before uh, below the 100-day average. And we're seeing those gains turning into losses quite fast. Uh, Denisa, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Denisa Sikova joining us there uh, with the latest on the markets. And for further market analysis, check out the Markets Live uh, blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Russia has launched another large-scale missile attack on Ukraine. Several cities have been hit, including the capital, Kiev. Widespread power outages have been reported. The attack comes a day after a top Ukrainian army commander warned that there is no doubt Russian forces will try to seize Kiev, seize Kiev as soon as next month. A Russian assault in the spring failed.
In the UK, consumer confidence is lingering near its record low for an eighth month. That's according to a survey by GFK. The results illustrate the impact that rising prices and the prospect of a recession is having on UK households. The Senate has averted a possible shutdown of the U.S. government. Thursday night, it passed a one-week funding bill needed to keep the government in business past Saturday. That gives negotiators more time to hash out agreements on funding levels for federal agencies and the current fiscal year. And Twitter has suspended the accounts of several prominent journalists covering the company's billionaire owner, Elon Musk. Musk says they were endangering his family by posting his real-time location. Those suspended reporters include those from The Washington Post, The New York Times, and CNN. And Anna, I have up on my screen here a tweet from Elon Musk back in April saying, I hope even my worst critics remain on Twitter because that is what, what free speech means. I guess maybe there's a line between doxing someone and exercising your right to free speech, maybe? Yeah, it seems it seems the posting of people's uh, locations is what he is specifically objecting to. Whether that is uh, whether he has a correct understanding of what those people do that did though is is another thing. Let's get back to the markets when we return. Then Kaylee will talk uh, with Des Lawrence from State Street. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Rough week for equities. U.S. futures drop along with European stocks as investors around the globe price in more rate hikes and grow more worried about recession. The latest COVID outbreak turns Beijing into a ghost town. It could be a preview of what's next for the rest of China as it moves on from COVID zero. And the European Union targets Russia once again. It's signed off on a ninth package of sanctions, targeting banks and drones this time. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kayleigh Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today as we head towards the weekend here in Europe and towards the U.S. equity session where you are, Kayleigh. Sentiment really tough for equities. Yeah, tough for potentially a third day in a row. Remember, Anna, we're already coming off of two consecutive days of losses for U.S. stocks. We're down about 3% over that time when it comes to the S&P 500. And in the future session this morning, the losses are just getting steeper as the session grows older and we get closer to the opening bell in about four hours time. Right now, S&P 500 futures down by about 1.2%. The focus really is on recession risk and whether or not the Federal Reserve is going to continue tightening through that and potentially over tighten maybe. That is really what the market is considering. And that's just not uh, not just an equity story, but it is a bond market story as well. So definitely one to keep an eye on. And I know you're going to continue to run us through European assets in just a moment. And I do want to mention though, Bitcoin is an asset to watch today. We're around that $17,000 level still. So yes, relatively stable, but we are still dealing with that crisis of confidence in the crypto industry as a whole. Binance being pushed to prove it has reserves to back customer assets one for one. It's auditing firm now no longer working with crypto clients, so that throws a little bit of a wrench in that plan. And as a result, you do have crypto-related stocks down in pre-market trading, even though Binance, of course, not a publicly listed U.S. company, so we can't track Binance. But Coinbase, Marathon Digital, they're both lower. And really broadly, Anna, you have technology stocks underperforming today. The mega caps like Microsoft, Alphabet, Go uh, which, of course, is the parent company of Google, Apple, all of them are lower in today's session to the tune of about one and a quarter percent, Anna. Yeah, so that's the pressure that we're seeing on some of those big tech names uh, coming through on the U.S. session. Uh, let's move on and show you what's happening here in Europe then. We've got Stocks Europe 600 down by 1.2% this morning. It is only the banking sector still that is in positive territory as markets increasingly focus on a higher rate environment or, or, or continue to focus on that higher rate environment, certainly here in, the, in, the, in Europe and specifically actually away from London in the Eurozone where we're seeing rising yields. Uh, that seems to be something that is pushing the banking sector higher. But elsewhere we see stocks under pressure uh, and, uh, and you can see down by 1.2 percent the pound at 121.57 uh, we actually have seen quite a recovery in the pound of course from those lows around 103 something which bodes very nicely on a personal level for me as i'm uh, planning to come to new york next week kaylee as you know uh, but we've got the pound at 121.59 then mixed data really in terms of the services sector which actually showed some strength this morning on that pmi data but also on manufacturing which was a whole lot weaker maybe that creates a bit of a headache for the bank of england the strength in the services side and the euro 106.22 is where we trade a lot of focus on that yesterday with that hawkishness from the ECB. We saw a spike up and then a subsequent retreat in the euro as a result of that. The Italian 10-year yield is really interesting because we see those yields going higher, ongoing focus on what's happening with, uh, uh, with interest rates from the ECB. And uh, that is something that the market continues to think about this morning, Kaylee. It's not just been a story of yesterday. Today we see uh, French yields, German yields, mm. UK yields and, uh, and, uh, and Italian yields all going higher. 
Yeah, and of course, Anna, it's been a massive week for central banks, and we have another central bank decision that just crossed the wire. The Russian central bank leaving its key rate, as expected, at 7.5%. And the Bank of Russia saying inflation as of December 12th is at 12.7%. They say labor shortages are increasing in many industries and that the global environment constrains economic activity. Of course, there are some idiosyncratic factors here for Russia when it comes to sanctions and being cut off from the broader global financial system. But right now, the ruble is holding losses versus the U.S. dollar after that rate decision. But as I alluded to, this rate decision, just one of many, I think almost a dozen, central bank rate decisions we've had this week. It has been a long one for sure. So joining us now to discuss is Des Lawrence, State Street Global Advisors, Senior Investment Strategist. Des, has your thinking on the trajectory of central bank policy in 2023 changed at all over the course of this week? Um, well, look, I think the, the, the data corroborates our thinking already. So it's not going to be a straight journey. We're going to see some bumps along the way. Um, we've held the view that there's a disinflationary impulse coming through down the line. And we'll see that more, more clearly as we go through next year. So I, I, I think, interestingly, what, what central banks have said, in a way, tells us we've got a bit further to go. But it also confirms there's a lot of uncertainty there. So to take a simple example, if you look at the Fed's range of its own projections for the Fed funds rate uh, in 2024, there's a 250 basis point range in, in, in span across that range, which tells us there's a lot of uncertainty even amongst Fed members. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we feel that as we move, move through next year, that uncertainty will, will weigh more the softness in the economy and that the interest rate hiking cycle will come to a halt and we'll, st we'll start to move into cuts later next year. It will take a while to get there, and we can see that happening across other economies, other blocks, probably a little bit later as we go through the first half of next year. But certainly something that's coming. Um, and I think in the meantime, we just got to brace ourselves for a lot of choppiness. So, Des, is essentially what you're saying when Chairman Powell stands at the podium preaching higher for longer when Christine Lagarde at the podium yesterday said very clearly in very decisive language the ECB is not pivoting that that is not credible I I, I think what, what they mean to be fair <clears throat> what they mean to be fair is it's subject to data mm -hmm. and that data in our view will is you, you've seen it in the UK the data this morning you've seen it in Euroblock data those PMIs are softening, the retail numbers are softening, a lot of stress at the consumer level. And central banks will acknowledge that. But what they do need is they just need to see more corroborating evidence that inflation is under control. So to be fair to the Fed, they've seen two nice prints in November and December. They probably want to see a continuation of that and they want to see it corroborated in other data. And as we see that, we think that's when their storyline will change. So to be fair, they, they don't have full, full visibility. So clearly today they're in the camp of let's get the inflation job done. Better to do or to warn of a little bit more initially than to have to do a lot more later. And I think in fairness, that's the spot they're in and it's that dilemma. But the data will help them to, to, to change direction as we go through next year when this current wave of softness potentially amplifies at a consumer level. Okay. So, Des, at the here and now, we're seeing a spike in European yields. Uh, but, you, but given what you've said there, does that mean you, you're not concerned about that being a threat to the equities arguments because uh, you think that the central banks are going to pivot? So those yields, that, that yield spike we're seeing today will unwind? Uh, yeah, no, no, that's a good point, Anna. I think, but it, it, it'll take a little bit of time. So that's back to my point. And you made it earlier this morning, the same point. We've seen, we haven't seen perfect unanimity or cohesion of thoughts across the Bank of England, the ECB, and look at the Fed range for 2024, as I said, a really wide span there. So they, the, there's a lot of uncertainty as regards how the policy transmission is working. 425 basis points in the US, 250 in the Euro bloc. That's going to feed through, and different members will have different views about when that bites. So I think when we look at fixed income, we can see that we're getting closer to good value, fair value in the U.S. But in the euro block, um, we're probably a little bit away from that yet, but we're getting in that direction. And that's, uh, to your point earlier, yeah. that banks, bank stocks doing nicely this morning. So there is some reprieve coming on the way, but we're not quite there yet in terms of the big picture. So I think as we move through next year, yeah, that, that will come about that we'll see... Um, some okay. kind of ceiling on rates.
Back to the U.S. stocks theme, uh, Des, and we heard from Bridgewater earlier on saying that one of the big game changers of late is that, you know, here we are going into next year and the Fed is not going to have your back. That was the words of, of one uh, Bridgewater voice that we heard from earlier on. So I suppose the point they're making there is even if we see a, a, a slowing of the hiking cycle, as we're witnessing, even a stopping of the hiking cycle maybe sometime next year, that's not the same as the very supportive low rates environment that we've seen. How much of that is a, how, is that a threat to your slightly more positive view for stocks? I, I think it's, it, it's always in the mix. Um, one of the things we've been looking at to try and read through that is the earnings cycle. And if you look at upgrades versus downgrades, they're still holding steady. Um, so when, when we look out through next year, we're reasonably constructive. We think investors should play it wisely, though, and have some exposure to factors like quality and value. Uh, value, to your point, on banks, quality simply, less leveraged companies, good quality earnings can give you a bit of protection as we get choppy. So we will see more volatility in the coming quarters, for sure. But overall, the market has come is starting to come back to levels where it's kind of be, closer to fair value. Now, for context, we've had a big run up since the end of September, and it's not unusual that we get that kind of a run up. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've stretched a little bit beyond. So we're taking a bit of profit back. I think to be fair, to go back to the point you made, um, the Fed is trying has got to try and tighten financial conditions. And as it talks a reasonable game, the stock market runs ahead which means it loosens financial conditions. So it's trying to navigate that thing. It's, it's, it's got its own feedback loop going on here with the markets. And those markets are loosening up policy a little bit. But now in the last two days, we've, we've gone back in, the, in, in a direction that Powell mm. and, and others would probably like. OK, thanks so much, Des. Uh, really good to speak to you this Friday. Des Lawrence of State Street Global Advisors. Coming up on the programme, Goldman Sachs sees commodities soaring in 2023. More from our interview with Goldman's Jeff Curry, uh, a really important uh, contribution to where inflation goes more broadly as well. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with John Williams, the president of the New York Fed. That conversation at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. While Goldman Sachs, Anna says commodities will be the best performing asset class once again in 2023, handing investors returns of more than 40%. Bloomberg spoke with Jeff Curry, the global head of commodities research at Goldman, about that call. Take a listen. Go back to our call for a super cycle back in October 2020. You had 42% returns in 2021. You know, so far we're headed towards somewhere around 23, 24% returns in, in um, 2022. So this is a continuation of the strong returns that we've been seeing over the last several years. I think bottom line, when we think about what a super cycle really is, it's not this big upward trend in prices that we have envisioned in our heads. It's a sequence of spikes. And because commodity prices perform an economic function, they have to rebalance supply and demand, bring them back in a line when they get out of line like they did at the end of 2021 in the early part of this year. Well, markets are rebalanced right now today. Why? Because China is being locked down. So demand came back down on top of supply, prices collapsed back down. But we have not been investing in supply. Supply is stagnant. So I have to just simply ask what happens when China, the largest commodity consumer in the world, the largest oil importer in the world, begins to rebound significantly in the first part of next year. It's going to tighten all of these markets tremendously and put a lot of upward pressure on prices. And I think the key point is, you know, you basically have the largest, you know, commodity consumer in the world essentially hibernating over the course of the last year. And that's been hiding a lot of this underinvestment. So really the core point here, underinvestment, weak demand today, but we see sequential growth in 2023. It begins to tighten these markets. Yeah. One last point, inventories have been exhausted. Mm -hmm. Jeff, let's talk about that China, China narrative. We are seeing a huge 180. The, the, there is a huge U-turn by China. They are reopening 
but what comes with that is likely to be a huge pickup in cases. We're starting to see data being crunched on that, and the numbers look pretty bad. How should we be thinking about the China reopening, therefore? Is it going to be similar to the one that we experienced, i.e. stop, start, stop, start? And, and kind of how does that work? How does that impact the commodity price? Um, I think oil is a testament to it. It's going to be a really rough, bumpy start at the very beginning. But when so oil is doing like this, you know, each week, big violent moves because here you are, you're going to have your fits and start, stops and stops. But when you take markets like oil equities or copper, they're more forward looking. They're looking into March, April of next year. As a result, they don't have that same kind of noise. So Joining us now for more on Goldman's uh, Commodities Call is Paul Wallace, Bloomberg Energy and Commodities Editor. This has been an important story, I think, this week, Paul, because when we got the first initial lines about China taking a different stance and reopening, and it looked clear that COVID zero was, was behind us, we, we didn't see necessarily such a huge embrace of that narrative by commodities markets. Certainly a lot of people were asking initially, why has oil not jumped on this? And, and, and it seems that Jeff Curry asking a similar question. You know, why have we, we are going to see, in his view at least, uh, higher demand story coming through at the beginning of next year. Hi, Anna. Yes, I think Goldman and uh, quite a few other people, um, analysts and, and traders in the commodity market, see the same thing. They see a big jump in commodity prices next year as China uh, reopens. I think in terms of the here and now, commodity investors, um, essentially, uh, they have this attitude of seeing is believing. Yes. Um, they know China is reopening and in many ways has already abandoned COVID zero, but they're not yet seeing that translate into higher consumption of, uh, of gas and, and oil and metals. And I think a lot of them expect at least the first quarter of next year to be very bumpy because as you, uh, as you and uh, Guy Johnson alluded to, it's, it's, it's pretty um, messy in China right now. Cases are spiking. So for the, at least in the short term, I think people are taking a wait uh, and see attitude. But at some stage, uh, toward the end of the first quarter or sometime in the second quarter, um, I think most uh, commodity analysts see a big um, pickup in, in commodities demand in China. So, Paul, if we're talking about demand picking up at some point next year when supply is still constrained, it strikes me that the closer or the longer we are into next year, the closer we are getting to the 2024 election in the United States in which we potentially could have President Biden running for a second term. We know that oil prices have dogged him for some time. Is there realistically going to be moves that he can take similar to what he has already undertaken over the course of the last year, tapping the SPR reserve, et cetera? Well, I tell you what, uh, Goldman is uh, Goldman is predicting a 43% rise in uh, commodities next year. I'm not sure there's anyone in the White House that uh, hopes that will come true, because mm -hmm. um, if Goldman is correct, that means uh, at least um, some more pain for uh, America and, frankly, the rest of the world in terms of uh, higher inflation. I mean, if you look at commodities year to date for 2022, they're up about 7 percent. They were up much higher on June um, uh, since when they've slumped. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sure the, the Biden administration hopes uh, uh, Goldman turns out to be wrong. Um, if, it, if it isn't and commodities do surge around the middle of um, next year, it'll It'll be interesting to see what the Biden administration does. In terms of oil, I think mm. there's not much more it can do um, with SPR okay. releases. It's already released a huge Paul. amount and so it's your finite resource. Thank you very much. Bloomberg's Bob Wallace joining us there on the Commodities Beat. Coming up, the countdown to the World Cup final is on with just two days before the showdown between Argentina and France. We're live in Doha. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, we are just two days away. I know Kaylee's extremely excited from the World Cup final in Qatar, where Argentina and France will face off for football's absolutely ultimate prize. Joining us now is Manus Cranny. He's at the Le Sale Stadium in Doha, one of the many stadia that were built for this tournament. And, uh, and Manus, I mean, what is, the, what is the atmosphere like on the ground then as, you, as we all get ready to, to watch the final or to try and ignore the final if we don't like football? 
<laughs> I think it depends on where you are. I mean, I'm not staying at the Four Seasons this time, Anna, so I'm not exactly in the rub and the hub. Uh, but I am uh, out and about last night, and there is a palpable sense of excitement. It depends whether it's the kids from various countries, from the Nordics uh, to Latin America. I mean, there is a real sort of sense of excitement. People are drifting in here now, uh, even though we're a couple of days ahead of the final of France and Argentina. There's two new planes, uh, two new flights coming from Argentina. They're going to charge a two a million, uh, actually they're going to charge uh, a, a quite a lot of money to get on that plane. So there's a monster amount of Argentinians about to arrive in this city. And I think that's going to change the atmosphere. So there's a great mix and there's a great rub, depending on the hotel you're in. Yeah, I would imagine that there's going to be a lot of money spent over the course of this weekend. And I'm sure there's been a lot of money spent yes. over the course of the World Cup in Qatar, Matt Manis. Would it be considered a success? Did this meet the expectation? It depends, and I said this sort of through the morning with Anna a little bit earlier on, how do we define success? For FIFA, it has been a monster success. Looks like $7.4 billion, $7, $7.5 billion will have been spent uh, through the process of this World Cup. But Qatar spent $300 billion bucks on this trade. $45 billion of it went on this, this whole area and this stadium, Lucille. The whole area is going to be a city afterwards in terms of viewership through the roof. USA England, the single biggest watch match ever in the history of soccer, not football, in the United States of America. So those <laughs> numbers are gargantuan. In terms of the actual flow of numbers of people in here, they hubbed out of Dubai and they haven't hit the numbers. 765 million, mm. we're looking for about 1.1 million at the halfway mark. So how do you define success? And then there's the geopolitical and social issues, which have been very, very pertinent in this World Cup. Yes, I, I can't believe that that was the most watched game. I have to say that was one of the most boring games that I watched, the England-US <laughs> game. I'm sure it set, back, it set back the cause of soccer in the United States by, by some decades. Anyway, um, on, you were just hinting <laughs> towards it there, Manners. Of course, defining success at this tournament, yes, you can look at the amount of yes. money spent and, and, and whether, you, whether it's met the goals of those who wanted to host it. But you can also look at brand Qatar and how that has performed on the world stage. Look, brand Qatar in of itself, Anna, and Kylie's, in, it, Kylie's in, in New York, you know, suddenly this island nation is on the world map, spectacular stadiums, but also there are the social issues which have risen and must, we must continue to talk about these, not just in Qatar, LGBT rights. Uh, human rights, labor rights, uh, and indeed there's an upcoming, uh, you know, uh, there's an upcoming court case in the United States of America which will uh, refer to an indictment leveled in 2020, accusations of payments to win this tournament. There are many facets that you can be negative about. However, I'd almost see you and raise you and say what you don't see at home in London and in the United States is a galvanizing of the Arab world. Mohammed bin Salman from Saudi Arabia coming here, mm. sitting with the Alfanis. These are many of the facets, but we should not hmm. not continue to talk about some of those issues that have been raised. Ladies. Yeah, absolutely. Manus, thank you very much. Manus Cranny on the ground reporting there from uh, Doha, uh, talking about uh, the controversy around the World Cup, but also the coming together of various Arab nations. Interesting phenomenon. And, uh, of course, we wish good luck to, I don't know, Argentina and to France uh, at the weekend. That <laughs> is it for early Argentina. edition. <laughs> I, uh, you are? OK, allez les bleus. I'll go with the French there. There's, the, there's a European thing. Um, right, that is it for early edition surveillance. More of that ahead. They'll be hearing from the New York Fed President, John Williams. This is Bloomberg.